cave diving is uniquely different from the other uh, diving environments. Divers uh, leave the safety of the open water, they go underground, and it's entirely different. We have to do everything relative to what is the time away from the entrance, and then how long does it take for us to get back. There's no quick aboards. There's no bailout in surface. There is no cutting decompression and taking your chances in a chamber. If you're an hour away from the surface because you were back in a cave, you are an hour away, regardless of what's going on. So it's an entirely different mindset for dealing with problems, bailout, for rebreathers, and everything, you know, for every aspect of what you're doing. Penetrations is what makes it different. We go in, we go away from the entrance, meaning we, we have to get back. So everything we do in terms of our, our consideration for the dive is very important. The distance away is the penetration, and for rebreathers, it's limited by our bailout gas um, or by our scrubber duration. And so the most important thing that we have to worry about is streamlining this. Because when you are swimming against a current, which most cave diving has done, you have to look at everything that you're doing, how the rebreather sits on you, how your bailout bottles are configured, everything that's going to put that package together so you can make that swim. It's not uncommon for cave divers to make three to four hour dives, and that is swimming. That is not even decompression. That is just swimming for three to four hours at a time. So how everything is carried is very important. So this is where side mounting came into a big part of rebreather diving, was how to carry those bottles. Depth is one of the main reasons that we started looking at rebreathers for dealing with bailout planning. I've, I've got the unfortunate experience of doing 20 body recoveries in caves, and I've looked at everything that goes along with what they did wrong, how could they have improved it, and what could we do better. Back at the first uh, AquaCore conference that uh, Mike Mendino put together, him and Dr. Hamilton came around asking everybody to define technical diving. I still remember today my definition, and that was uh, when a diver switches from one regulator to another underwater, he's now technical diving. And that's going to be where we have the most fatalities, is going to be when divers switch regulators. So we had a number of fatalities in the cave country where divers switched regulators and switched to the wrong gas because of it. So it resulted in their death. Well, rebreathers don't have to do that. No matter what you're doing, for no matter what your depth is, it's automatically controlling everything. So we limit all this regulator switching when we're doing these penetrations and all these long dives and we're on a rebreather. All we have to do is worry about our bailout gas as to, to get the best situate, the best gas mix we can, but we eliminate all the regulator switching that goes on underwater. That's one of the biggest assets I have found with going to a rebreather is the pleasure of never having to decide which regulator to put in my mouth after I've already been in the water for 120 minutes. I can just keep breathing, VO2 is set, and everything goes on. Now, the other things that we look at, team management, for uh, how we put everything together, and I'll get into that in a minute. Bailout rebreathers are coming up in consideration. I've heard a lot of talks about that, how to manage those. And then the other thing is decompression. How do we deal with decompression? With depth, decompression on a rebreather makes life so much easier to be able to stay on that constant PO2. Time and PO2 management. This is another thing because I just mentioned longer dives, three to four hour bottom times. I, I, when I teach, I'm always telling my students, everything you learned in nitrox about your, uh, your CNS clock, your OTUs and all that, that you just kind of forgot about because you realized you'd never hit the maximum on your OTUs and such, your pulmonary clock, you get, need to remember it now that you're on a rebreather because maintaining that constant PO2 on those long dives will be a concern. So a lot of times the cave divers are running lower set points than what's considered the norm for open water diving. I've heard 1.3 thrown around a lot, and for the most part, cave divers are running 1.2 and even lower at 1.0 to deal with those longer bottom times that they can achieve. Bailout management, there's a lot of controversy about the methods. We have three types of bailout that we consider for uh, cave diving. We have a team management philosophy, a self-sufficient, and a stage philosophy. Team and self-sufficiency, they require redundancy. And this is one of the big things with cave diving that with open water scenarios take on a little bit of a different look. 
In open water, you might consider 80 cubic foot of gas being enough for a bailout, and you carry that in a single aluminum 80. Well, in cave diving, we don't look at it that way. If you need 80 cubic foot of gas, you carry it in two aluminum 40s. And then the progression there is to go to 160 cubic foot of bailout gas and carry that in two aluminum 80s. And a lot of people ask us how we determine how much bailout gas is enough. We look at it based on our open circuit experience of the dives and look at distance traveled from the entrance. So if normal divers running a set of 104s, as we call them, and pumped to normal cave pressures would be approximately 300 cubic foot of gas. I mean, excuse me, about 240 cubic foot of gas on their back. And they dive what we call the thirds rule. That means they use 80 cubic foot to penetrate, and they reserve two thirds for the exit. So we'll carry 80 cubic foot of gas to deal with that same distance to get back out as a minimum. And when you're, when you're doing this for cave diving, the reason for carrying it in multiple bottles is so that you can have a team philosophy for sharing gas. I always like to tell people in a situation where you have to hand off gas, the bottle's never half full, it's half empty. So you want to make sure that when you hand off gas to someone, that when they give you back their bottle that they've already breathed, you know, you're not going to be able to use it again, and you've still got your own bailout. You don't want to be in a situation where, in a cave, where you're still an hour away from an entrance, and somebody hands you an empty bottle where you're reluctantly giving them one bottle of your own bailout gas. So by having two, you can make the decision uh, if he needs more, whether you give it to him or you out swimming. It's your choice. Okay. There's also that when we talk about self-sufficient, it works in the same way that you carry enough gas, but it's always in two bottles. And then we get into what we call the stage bailout philosophy, which co coincides with longer distance penetrations, scooters and such, where when you're riding a scooter in a cave, that gets you that much further away from an entrance. It's not like being on a wreck where you might be able to buzz the wreck three times. A scooter can get you an effective, you know, half a mile to a mile away from the entrance. And on a rebreather especially, you will you won't even see the gauges move. Okay? You, you might, your, your work of breathing is going to be so low and your metabolic rate is going to be so low, you might be doing good at, you know, at a 0.5 when you're being pulled by a scooter. But if you have to swim, it's going to change that. So we will carry bailout gas to compensate for the scooter. So here again, 2,000 foot, 80 cubic foot of gas, it's with the scooter. We drop the scooter, we swim. We leave that gas, and now we're down to just our bailouts that we're wearing. So it's not uncommon to see a, a cave diver carrying three and four bailouts on the dive, but they get dropped as he gets further into the cave. So when he's finally down to the point where he's getting off of a scooter, he's swimming, and he might be left with just two 40s, even though there's two other 80s in the cave that he has left along the trail. Mixed team considerations seem to be one of the biggest things that we deal with in the cave diving community because of the fact that we are pushing from the entrance. The open circuit emergency procedures are different from the CCR emergency procedures. Open circuit, divers carry a long hose. And if your buddy has a problem, you pass the long hose, put the short hose in your mouth, and you start to exit. Well, when it comes to... Uh, open circuit divers diving with uh, closed circuit divers, this is where we start to get into the concerns where all of a sudden open, open circuit diver is looking at the closed circuit diver and going, where, where's your long hose for me? And we're like, I don't have one for you. <laughs> you know, I've got my bell out right here. If you need gas, I'll hand you a bottle. Yeah. And they're like, well, wait a minute. I'm not sure I'd like that technique because you're only giving me 40 cubic foot of gas. And it's like, well, yeah, that's all I've got. So a lot of times in mixed, mixed team situations, open circuit divers now have to carry a, what we call a bailout bottle or a buddy bottle because the closed circuit diver doesn't have enough gas. Unless, of course, you get into a team of three and four people, now there's plenty of gas to share. In a team management philosophy, the rule of thumb is one and a half times the gas to get at least one diver out of the cave. So if each diver is carrying 80 cubic foot of gas and it's a three-man team, you've got plenty of gas. If each diver is carrying uh, 80 cubic foot of gas and it's a two-man team, 
you have just enough gas to get one diver out and the other diver to come out with about 40 cubic foot. But if it's a single diver carrying that minimalistic approach, he's going to find himself with no reserves or no one to look at. So that diver you might see wearing 280s, so he's got more gas. But when you put mixed teams in the scenario, it becomes very questionable as to whether or not there would be enough gas if an open circuit diver had a problem that required a bailout scenario. So anytime you, we start looking at that, since we have to think about that travel back to the exit, we have to look at how much gas is there between the team. And I see a lot of dives going on where there is no consideration for that. The open circuit guys are diving just a set of doubles, and the closed circuit uh, diver is diving his rebreather and a single 80 for bailout. So there's been no provision for dealing with a mixed team scenario. When we deal with, we went through this with side mount, uh, mixed teams with doubles, and that was easy enough to, uh, to deal with. All we had to do was uh, put a long hose on one of the cylinders, make sure you manage your gas properly and everything's fine. But when we start dealing with mixed team scenarios for cave diving, it's something that needs to be talked about a little bit more as to how to deal with these scenarios. And it's not like we have issues with it but it's been ingrained and in training through all the open circuit divers that everything is a buddy team and this is how it works. So a lot of times the closed circuit divers aren't thinking that way because they're, they're going totally self-sufficient. Communications are very important uh, when it comes to mixed team scenarios because the open circuit diver needs to know what those LEDs flashing on that diva are all about on the front of your rebreather. So if there is a situation or something he can help you with, he knows what he needs to do. He knows what it means when you switch from your loop to a bailout bottle, that the dive is being aborted and not to be continued on. Okay. This is the other area of concern for the cave diving community, is equipment modifications. Cave divers, especially those that got into rebreathers, were very big into you know, pushing the cave, exploration. So we see side mount rebreathers, and some of them are built just like Dr. Harry built his uh, in Australia, and they put them together, and then they take them in the cave and try to use them. Because for the most part, you can take something to a, a Florida cave, and no one's going to stop you from taking it in the water. So you can take it in and be your own uh, crash test dummy. Uh, there's lots of modifications to units I see in the area, and it, it that in itself is one of the big concerns to me is all the, user, all the user modifications I see on rebreathers. And when we start talking about caves, if we start getting into this exploration and modification of rebreathers that go along with exploration, usually exploration is pushing the bounds of what's already been explored, meaning it's going to be low cave, and especially with side-mounted rebreathers, they're trying to go into places where you can't take a back-mounted rebreather. This usually coincides with having low visibility, which means how are you going to monitor systems and almost zero visibility? You know, all you can do is listen to that steady rhythm of a solenoid and going, okay, everything's good because I can't see anything, I'm just on a line. So we have those issues to contend with, too, in terms of being able to monitor in low visibility situations that we put ourselves in uh, because we are exploring. Okay. So the big thing here is you know, cave divers must return to the exit. So the plan never includes that immediate abort. So the thing we must think about most are our planning and emergency procedures. And when you go through a cave CCR course, most of it is about dealing with emergency procedures, how to fly the unit manual, because like I've, I've heard other people talk about, the options for technical diving in order to stay on the loop. In cave diving, it can be very important if you've been pushing yourself to get far back in a cave where you might still have a two-hour exit to go to. So anything you can do to maximize a stay on the loop you want to do, and all that's done in the CCR training, manual flying, semi-closed, every bit of it. But emergency procedures are taught and emphasized quite a bit in the CAVE CCR course. Okay, thank you.